In this module, we are going to explore omics technology, such as genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. We will be looking at each of those omics areas in the next several videos. In this video, our purpose is to give an overview of omics in general and look at some of the applications of why we are interested in omics and what exactly do we mean when we say genomics, proteomics, or metabolomics? What are some of the similar characteristics that these technologies have in common. So let's get started. As we look at the diagram on the page here, what we are seeing is essentially the central dogma of biology in action that the genome, the genes of the cell, get transcribed and translated into protein. And then if we take that central dogma a step further, what happens is that those proteins catalyze chemical reactions. Some of those proteins catalyze chemical reactions that yield the variety of metabolites that are found within a cell. And so in the world of omics technologies, we can look at any level of this central dogma to evaluate on large scale the genes that are present within an organism. That would be genomics. The proteins that are present within an organism. That would be proteomics or the metabolites that are present within an organism, that would be metabolomics. And by looking at one or more of these three types of biomolecules at a large scale, meaning not just looking at one particular gene or one particular protein or one particular molecule, but looking at many of them simultaneously, that will enable us to gain a more complete understanding of a particular biological system than focusing on any one individual gene, protein, or molecule. So the old school way of looking at complex biological systems was to focus really on one or a few genes, proteins, or molecules. But since biology is complex, that gave a very narrow view of understanding of how the cell or how the population of cells focus and work overall. And so due to that complexity of biological systems, it's a much more powerful thing to be able to look at large scale at a variety of genes, proteins, and metabolites rather than focusing on just one or a few. Because generally, due to the complexity of biological systems, when there's a change to one component of the system, there are changes to many others as well. For example, if a cell is under stress, then quite likely there's going to be a variety of biological chemical changes that take place within that cell. And so metabolomics, proteomics, and genomics look at, from the perspective of the metabolites for metabolomics, the proteins for the proteomics, and the genes for the genomics, look at the changes in the entire set of genes, the entire set of proteins, the entire set of metabolites, or some rather broad subset of the genes, proteins, or metabolites within a cell to establish what differences exist between different organisms or between different treatment and control groups. And so let's go ahead and jot some of that down. The three areas of omics that we are going to focus on are genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. There is also some additional areas of omics technology, such as transcriptomics, which would be looking at gene transcripts, namely mRNA, and um, some other derivatives of this as well. But the three main areas of focus are going to be in the areas of genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics. And what all of these will have in common for us is that they are all going to be looking at the large scale study, meaning not just looking at a tiny number of a handful of different genes, proteins, or metabolites, but looking at simultaneously many different metabolites. So it's going to be the large scale study of particularly in the case of genomics, the large scale study of genes, proteomics, large scale study of proteins, and metabolomics, the large scale study of metabolites. So the common theme that we are going to see as we go through videos that correspond to genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics is that in each case, we're going to be interested in the simultaneous study 
of many different genes or many different proteins or many different metabolites. Some terminology that relates closely to this are the terms genome, proteome, and metabolome. When we refer to the genome of an organism, what we're referring to is the entire set of genes that are present within that organism. Similarly, when we refer to the proteome, we are referring to the entire set of proteins within an organism. And when we refer to the metabolome, we are referring to the entire set of metabolites within an organism. And if we think about the lifespan of a cell or an organism over the course of life, the genes that are present will remain constant because the genetic code, the DNA within the cells does not for the most part change throughout life. On the other hand, the proteins and metabolites are more dynamic than is the genome because of the fact that there are a variety of processes going in the cell that impact which particular genes are expressed, meaning which particular genes are transcribed and translated at a given time into proteins. And hence, um, when we think about what proteins are being produced, that directly corresponds to what metabolites are being produced at a particular time because the proteins are the enzymes that catalyze the reactions leading to the metabolites. So when we think about over the lifespan of an organism, the proteins and metabolites will vary wildly between what stage of life an organism is at or what particular stressors an organism is at at a given time in their life cycle. So the proteins and metabolites are highly variable based on things like the environment, life stage, and a variety of other variables, etc. Whereas the genome, the entire set of genes, is nearly constant over the course of an organism's life if we think about what genes are present within that particular organism or that particular cell. The, the only exception to that is during cell division, if there is a mutation event of DNA, that could alter a gene during the course of the life of an organism. But for the most part, we can think of the genome as being relatively constant. The proteins and metabolites, or the proteome and metabolome, in other words, being much more variable. So we can use these tools of genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics to establish differences between populations of organisms or between treatment and control groups of organisms, looking at things like what is the response of a particular cell line to a stressor, such as what happens to a cell line in the event of increased temperature, or what are the differences between populations of organisms that are healthy versus diseased. For example, coral bleaching disease has been a huge problem in the Caribbean, and what scientists have done is taken samples of healthy coral versus diseased coral and used tools such as metabolomics tools to compare the metabolites that are present in diseased coral versus healthy coral at large wide scale to discover what differences in metabolites consistently exist amongst the diseased coral versus the healthy coral. And that helps to establish by looking at and discovering particular molecules that correspond and correlate with disease that enables the pinpointing of so-called biomarkers for disease so that then scientists can look at specific individual molecules as biomarkers to establish the health state of the coral. So omics is also really prevalent right now in what's referred to as personalized medicine. So we'll use this as an example to introduce and highlight the omics areas before we get into later videos where we look at genomics, proteomics, and metabolomics individually in more detail. So to introduce this, personalized medicine is the concept that rather than a one-size-fits-all approach to medicine where each patient receives the same medicine at the same dose or 
The determination of the correct medicine for a patient is largely trial and error where a patient with a particular set of symptoms will try one medicine. If that doesn't work particularly well, they'll try something else. If that doesn't work particularly well, they'll try something else. Um, for example, that commonly happens with cancer patients where they will try one cancer chemotherapy and that chemotherapy does not work well. And so then they're switched to some other cancer chemotherapy until hopefully they find a drug that works. In the case of personalized medicine, rather than this trial and error approach to determining what the appropriate cancer chemotherapy is or the appropriate medicine for some other disease, what happens is that the person's particular genome, proteome, or metabolome is evaluated in order to determine the best course of treatment for that particular patient by pinpointing exactly what the metabolite, protein, or gene origin of their particular disease is. So here's one way that this could work from, from the beginning, from the get-go of understanding what um, exactly would be the appropriate personalized medicine route for a particular patient. So in order to know the appropriate personalized medicine route of a particular patient, we would need to compare the genome, proteome, or metabolome between a patient that had a particular disease and someone that was healthy so that we would know what about that particular patient at a molecular level is causing them to have this disease. So in order to establish that, what we would need to do is take a population of patients that had a particular symptom set or a particular disease and compare aspects of the genome, proteome, or metabolome to a population of several healthy persons to establish what are the distinct tractable differences between patients that have a particular disease and those that do not. So here's kind of how we could approach this schematically, drawing out as an illustration here what I was just mentioning in words. So we have a population, meaning not just a single person, but a group of people that all have a particular set of symptoms or a particular disease. So these are all people that we would hypothesize due to the fact that they have similar symptoms or a similar disease or the same disease. We would hypothesize that they have the same sorts of differences in their metabolome, proteome, or genome from a population of several healthy individuals. So with the patients that would be enrolled in this personalized medicine study, what would happen is that samples of blood, saliva, or other bodily fluids from which one could obtain DNA, proteins, and metabolites would be collected from the patients that had a particular disease versus healthy patients. So we would collect samples to enable the isolation of DNA, protein, and or metabolites, depending upon which omics technology the experimenter wanted to evaluate here. So we'd collect those samples and then one would conduct genomics analyses, meaning sequence the genomes, the complete set of genes from a particular organism. They would conduct proteomics analyses, meaning compare the proteins between the people with the disease and the persons without. Or metabolomics, meaning use analytical tools, such as NMR and mass spectrometry that we talked about in the last unit, to compare the metabolites amongst the healthy persons versus the diseased persons. And then at that point, what that would establish, assuming that this works out well, is a set of consistent differences that we can pinpoint between patients that have a disease and those that do not. So this would ideally, if the study works out correctly, as we would hope it would, it would allow us to pinpoint specific genes, proteins, or metabolites 
that are linked to that particular disease. One example conceptually of something like this at the level of metabolites would be that if one were to take a population of patients with diabetes versus a population of patients without diabetes and compare the metabolome, one would see differences in the blood glucose levels for one example of people with diabetes versus those without. Um, in the case of genetic differences, if we took a set of patients that had, say, cystic fibrosis, which is a genetically linked disorder, compared to healthy persons, we would see a clear linkage to a specific gene that had mutated in patients with cystic fibrosis. And due to that gene mutation, there would be a corresponding mutation in the protein that corresponds with that. So you'd see a difference at both the genome level and the proteome level as well in those patients. So it enables us to pinpoint specific genes, proteins, or metabolites that are involved in disease. And as a result of that, that can guide the treatment of those particular diseases. Um, specifically, many diseases result from a mutant gene and hence a mutant protein. And if we know exactly what protein has mutated, that can be used to guide the application of specific drugs that will either activate that mutated protein, if that is what is needed to restore the function of it, or will inhibit that mutant protein if that mutant protein is performing a function in the cell that it should not, and we want to just shut off that protein so it is no longer effective, we can discover a drug inhibitor of that protein. And it's super useful to have that knowledge of exactly what protein we need to activate or inhibit with a drug that guides very nicely the discovery of drugs that are very specific to that particular protein. Um, additionally, if we know what gene mutation has occurred, such technologies as gene therapy can be used to supplement or, um, or attenuate, meaning knock down the mutant gene so that the disease symptoms can be eliminated or at least controlled. So there's a huge array of possibilities in this world of personalized medicine where we can look at genes, proteins, and metabolites to aid us in diagnosing a disease and also in treating a, a disease. So it's really powerful from the perspective of both diagnosis and treatment of disease. And as the knowledge of the genome, proteome, and metabolome for large populations of people increases, the power of personalized medicine increases as well because we have an increasing body of knowledge overall about what genes, proteins, and metabolites are in both healthy people and people with particular diseases. So what we are going to be doing in the upcoming videos is we are going to be looking in more depth at the tools and techniques of metabolomics and additional applications of those. For example, we'll be answering questions such as, how do we apply mass spectrometry and NMR in metabolomics? Because in earlier videos, what we looked at was using mass spectrometry and NMR in cases where we had pure individual metabolites. We're looking at one compound at a time. Now we have magnified the complexity of that problem of NMR or mass spectrometry because we're trying to look at a large assortment of metabolites within a cell. We're trying to look holistically at what's going on in a cell from the perspective of the metabolites. Similarly, we will also look at how can we analyze a proteome? What are the experimental tools there? How do we go about that? And what information can we gain from those types of experiments to help us in practical applications of linking together chemistry and biology using chemical tools to solve biological problems? Um, we will also look at what are the techniques and tricks of the trade for genomics. How do we go about sequencing a genome of an organism? And once we have that sequence, what do we do with that sequence information? And how do we apply that sequence information to solve real world problems? So that's what's coming up in the rest of the modules for this unit.